Now, fundamental to all issues to do with climate and indeed other environmental issues has to be the matter of justice. This is really a matter of intense global injustice. It's the rich nations and the rich people who have been primarily responsible for the climate crisis and indeed the rest of the environmental crisis. Generally, the richer you are, the bigger your environmental footprint. And it's those rich people who tend to be affected last and least. And yet it's the world's poor who are affected first and most, even though they are the least responsible for this massive global crisis. So if justice doesn't sit at the heart of our climate talks, and if justice isn't central to government's concerns, then frankly, the conference is a farce. Because unless we do something to address this gross global disparity, where it's the rich what get the gain and the poor what get the pain, then we're going to perpetuate that disparity, whatever other measures governments seek to introduce. So I'm delighted and honoured to have three people with me today who are all working at the frontier of justice. I'm not going to say the cold face of justice, but at the very frontier of justice um, when it comes to climate and environmental issues. Um, there's the celebrated environmental lawyer, Fahana Yamin. There's um, the leading activist with Fridays for Future and other initiatives in the Philippines, Mitzi Janelle Tan. And there's Rhiannon Osborne from Students for Global Health, who's also now one of the key crucial voices in the fight for global justice. So thank you, all three of you, very much for joining me. And I'd like to start with you, Fahana, because um, as well as being a very long-standing advocate for justice in general, you've now launched a new initiative called Justice Reset. So set the scene and please tell us about Justice Reset. Thank you so much, George, and thank you so much, uh, Mitzi and Rian, what, for, for the work that you're doing. Um, so I think we've reached a fundamental fork in the road where the three treaties, you know, I'm holding them up here, they're very battered, which basically small islands and vulnerable countries have, have asked for and negotiated. We would never have these if the vulnerables had not stood up and demanded accountability, demanded action. Um, so these three treaties are not working. Uh, and what's happening is a massive lack of action and a massive amount of greenwashing from the world's biggest polluting countries and companies. That's what's happening. And they are not uh, willing to talk about the consequences of three decades of inaction. That's what's happening. Loss and damage is happening. Harm is happening. People everywhere are experiencing climate impacts. They are living the uh, IPCC red, red code right now. This is not in the future for them. This is right now. And that's why uh, many people who, not just as long as me, who've been in the game, are so frustrated. Frustrated isn't the right word. You know, some expletives probably will do. But, you know, that's that's the degree of uh, broken promises. And we come here with broken hearts, but with a strong resolve to demand this uh, recognition that harm is happening. It must be recognized. It must be acted on. That takes the form of many different things, but that's the fundamental starting point. And that's the starting point why we're calling it a justice reset, because there's no point talking about 1.5 or the 100 billion. Those are figures that are now uh, far from the reality of what is happening. So that's the demand for a justice reset. And not, frankly, also to talk about it in the slightly legal and nerdy language of, of the negotiations where, you know, we've talked for three decades about the common the common but differentiated and respective capabilities principle. We've talked about rich countries versus poor countries. We all have to now look uh, honestly at the role of everyone. And obviously the biggest polluters have the biggest voice and say, and that's why they're not turning up, George, you know? <laughs> that's why they're still arguing the G20 in Rome for not phasing out coal. So maybe your comment about being at the coal face was the right metaphor. We, we are all at the coal face of justice, frankly. Mm. So, so tell me about the, the, the idea of Justice Reset and, and how it's going to change things if you manage to get it widely adopted. So, so we're asking for a fundamental review by everyone 
uh, of what's now needed. So we've got these detailed provisions, we've got many platforms, we've set up many committees, we've got all these obligations. And now actually they're not adding up because they were the vulnerable countries, vulnerable people are not really being protected and they're going to go home from this COP empty-handed largely. You know, even if we get to 100 billion by the end of, you know, November the 12th, uh, some magic, you know, amount of money, ta-da, is found, we know that this money has not reached vulnerable countries and vulnerable communities. Uh, most of that 100 billion, the 80 billion that's on the table, has been given to what we call mitigation, most of that money did not get to the uh, poorest countries because they cannot uh, uh, apply. There's so many barriers in the way of them getting it. And a lot of the money that we could say is adaptation money, which is just 20 percent of the money that was committed instead of 50 percent of what was committed. Most of that money has come in the way of loans. Can you believe it? Like we're we're being given loans. Uh, debt-ridden countries who are now in the middle of a spiralling debt crisis are being offered loans to deal with the consequences of delay, inaction and historic injustices. So climate action is actually just the summing up of all of the historic injustices. It is the legacy and the consequence of uh, colonialism and imperialism and uh, an extractive use of resources so it's the harm that's caused to indigenous communities for developing countries whose lands, uh, forests, soils, minerals were extracted uh, largely for our benefits, actually, in this country and others. So that's what Justice Reset is all about. And we're asking for, uh, first of all, a recognition that our machinery of governance isn't working. Secondly, that we have a dialogue uh, uh, over this and submissions. Then we upgrade and fundamentally make sure that those who are now in harm's way are, are protected, and we can do that. There is harm on the way. Uh, it is happening, but we can do something about it. Now, now, now Mitzi Janelle Ten, um, you, you, your home country is the Philippines, which has been hit already by some horrendous impacts. Could you tell me about what the Philippines has suffered, but also tell me about, about your work to, to bring forward the voices of people from your own nation and from the rest of the global south? So it's just exactly as Farhan and you already mentioned earlier, it's the countries that are more, most exploited, it's the countries that are the poorest that are experiencing the climate impacts the worst. So the Philippines, we have had the three strongest storm landfalls in recorded history and that's a statistic that is kind of abstract to some people. To me that means that I grew up being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom. I grew up being afraid that the next storm would wash my home away. I saw my communities with people stranded on rooftops up to the third floors of buildings calling for help for days and days. Because we are not able to adapt, because we are not able to deal with the loss and damages because of the historical and ongoing over-exploitation of our lands and our natural resources. So as part of the Justice Reset, for me, it's not just about drastic carbon dioxide emissions. Just as Farhana mentioned, we really, really need to make sure that when we talk about transitioning out of this fossil fuel industry, it's not just about transitioning to renewable energy, but really having justice at its core, because otherwise you'll end up, let's say, maybe having solar panels, but then um, farmers are displaced for it, or having hydro, energy, uh, hydro dams, but indigenous peoples are pushed out of their ancestral lands. Or maybe we'll see the same thing that's happening with the COVID vaccines, where vulnerable countries go into debt trying to get the, the, the technology, the patents, all of these things just to have the renewable energy that we need to survive. And that is a lot of what we do in, in the work that I do with Fight Future MAPA, which is most affected peoples and areas, making sure that the voice of the Global South activists are amplified and that beyond representation, beyond having Global South activists at, rep, uh, at conferences and, and being heard, it's about being listened to and action following from that. Because even if we're heard, even if we're there, if there is no action, then it does nothing. So, I mean, it, it strikes me that what's going on is really an extension almost of colonialism. It, it's like, you know, the, the rich countries for centuries grab the resources, grab the land, grab the labour, of people in the poorer nations and now we're dumping the results of that on you effectively um, and and so you know, what we're talking about here is really something quite fundamental it's almost a sort of step change 
in international relations. So, Mitzi, do, do you see any chance of that happening, either at this climate summit or in future? I think it has to happen, either at this climate summit or in the future. We have to take steps towards that change, to change the system that we have, because the climate crisis isn't just an environmental problem. It's a systemic problem that's causing harm to people at its core. So what does that mean? We can't use the same capitalist, profit-oriented, colonialist, imperialist system that we have to get rid of the climate crisis. We have to have that fundamental system change. And this COP26, this UN Climate Summit, is so crucial to make sure that we're pushing towards the right direction, pushing towards that world that we want to build together. And I know it's not going to be a snap. World leaders decide this. We suddenly have the amazing world that we're fighting for. It's not. We're here to make sure that we're pushing towards the right direction to minimize as much suffering as possible and to make sure that we're going towards a world where no one is left behind. And, and do you see any realistic chance of that actually happening, of, of the leaders of the rich nations like ours here in the UK or like Joe Biden paying heed to what you're saying and being prepared to um, actually accept the idea of a reset taking place? I think that's where people power comes in. We have to come together on the streets, in the policies, all forms of civil society, all forms of the movement, those who are talking and negotiating with the leaders, those who are pressuring them from the outside. We all have to come together and demand for this justice. Just as Farhana mentioned before, all the previous policies and agreements that we had would never have happened if the vulnerable nations and small island nations didn't stand up. So now it's our turn as everyone to come together and stand up against the injustice that's happening. Thank you. Now, Rhiannon, um, Students for Global Health, um, that might not sound um, to, to, to most people to have an immediate connection with climate, but could you explain that connection and, and tell us what your organisation is about? Yeah, of course. So I think we have a tendency to think about health as, you know, you get sick and you go to a doctor and you're in a hospital and then you get treated. But Fundamentally, health is political, it's environmental, it's social. And as a student doctor, what I'm seeing is people at the forefront of not just the climate crisis. So the climate crisis has a huge impact on health, including um, increased risk and increased frequency of things like pandemics, um, but also the effects of PTSD um, from people who are facing natural disasters. So as a health community, as a student doctor, that's the crisis that I'm fighting and working towards avoiding and also because as other speakers have amazingly highlighted it's not going to be the people who are causing this crisis who are suffering the worst but I think lots of the work that we do as students for global health is saying that not only is the climate crisis going to kill people make people sick in the most unjust way it's the system that's causing the climate crisis that's making people sick as well and that is killing people and making people's lives horrendous in the most horrible way so right even if these systems weren't producing huge amounts of emissions we have a food system which displaces indigenous people puts us into dangerous contact with ecosystems which should be left and enabled to flourish with their indigenous um, the people who live on those lands whilst those food systems create huge amounts of money for monopoly capitalist organizations and don't actually meet the needs of our bodies our minds or our communities and disconnect people from from land and and themselves and each other and you see this in the same, the structure of the global economy as well. You know, if a global economy was structured to look after people, we wouldn't have it so that rich countries were implementing boosters while most of the world hasn't had their first vaccine yet. And we wouldn't have it where air pollution is now a bigger killer than HIV and AIDS. So a lot of what we do is highlighting that, do you know what, the, these systems aren't working anyway. And what we need far more than just emissions is a complete reset of the systems that have enabled us to get here, of a system that enables things like colonialism and imperialism to continue in the form of world trade rules and in the form of power dynamics, and a system which fundamentally doesn't support the flourishing of people or the flourishing of planet and is based purely on extractivism and profit. So as a health community, as a student doctor, I see just all of the time people who are sick who are not sick. It's the economy that's sick, it's the systems that are sick. And those are the things that we really need to fight. 
And tell me about the activism um, that, that you're involved in to try to bring those issues to the forefront of politicians' minds. Um, yeah, so a lot of the work I do um, is um, centred around justice and justice resets um, as well, um, which I take inspiration from both of the two other panellists on this call for doing that work. Um, so I campaign at the moment with a group called Health for a Green New Deal in the UK, um, which is advocating for a transformative Green New Deal, a 10-year plan to actually address the climate crisis in the UK, um, but with that in global angle. So looking at the UK's historic role in exploiting countries through colonialism, capitalism, and now through the climate crisis as well, and making sure that the UK owes its climate debt and pays that climate debt to those countries, um, in particular through things like loss and damages, and also looking at countries like the UK and their refugee and migrant rights. And what we're seeing at the moment is a huge crackdown on the rights of refugees and migrants. Already we have a migrant charging system in the NHS, so everyone's right to healthcare is not fulfilled, right? So it's also about holding these countries accountable um, to people who are going to be most impacted, who are going to be potentially vulnerable, not because they're vulnerable inherently, because they're made vulnerable by countries like the UK not fulfilling their rights, not giving refugees proper access to health and not um, paying their climate debt to other countries. So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment and mobilising young people um, and the health community to demand that of the UK government. Yeah, there was a recent report for HANA, wasn't there, um, showing that the rich nations are now spending more money securing their borders than they're actually releasing in climate help for poorer nations. It's an astonishing situation, isn't it? But it's not. If you look at the underlying logic, the underlying logic of the richer countries, including the UK, is to, is to protect their own nations through legal borders and through physical borders. So you saw that with wall building, literally, what more metaphor could you have? That's the real adaptation policy for the rich people to protect themselves. And actually the appeal is, you know, if you're in these borders, even if you're a black and brown person and not benefiting, you will be safe. And let let the others, you know, literally, you know, fry in hell. That is the absolute reality that is facing the world. And that's why, you know, I'm wearing around here a Solidarity Knows No Borders uh, mask. And that is the reality that we're facing. So the, the, the DNA of our systems, others, black and brown people, whether living here or living in the majority world, it, uh, it others and diminishes uh, women. It makes uh, vulnerable people, the elderly. It, it means that the, our young people, is is future is being robbed. And we are actually the vast majority of the people. Uh, so women, black and brown people all over the world, youth, disabled people, these are at the front line, you know, whether it's a visible disability or a mental disability, whether it's a health related uh, a set of issues. You know, gender justice, health justice, racial justice is climate justice. And that's what the fundamental reset is about. It's not really a new demand. It's just actually amalgamating and putting us all in, on the same footing. Because some people have thought, OK, let's fix this through the health sector. OK, let's fix this with a bit of anti-discrimination legislation. OK, let's fix this with some money for crashes. And that's really not the scale of the solution that's required. The scale of the solution that's required is a reset of the the whole system which came about you know 400 years ago basically based on the fundamental notion that black and brown people weren't even people we were not people in the eyes of the law that long ago we were slaves or to be extracted it, nature was not seen as having rights it was there to see, be exploited so that's the reset that we're calling for a fundamental re-evaluation of our systems and then one last comment the most important uh, tool of the powerful is to make you think you have no power yeah. And so we actually must believe in our power to change things. And we have that power and we have made these changes. We have got three treaties. We are holding everyone to account. This isn't going to happen overnight, but fundamental uh, system change is always people led. It is always comes from the realization that we can change the systems, that they don't have power over us and we're not powerless. Now, now Mitzi, that the four of us are talking about system change and i think we're all agreed that you know you can't actually make any significant difference by just messing about at the margins of this within the existing system and yet you know the g20 leaders in particular they're talking about money you know we'll, we'll give you some money 
not very much money. Some of it will be in the form of loans. You'll have to pay us back more than we give you, it's give you, um, etc. But it's almost as if we're talking a different language. We're like in completely different spheres, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. It's like all they see are numbers and statistics and graphs of the economy. While we are seeing people, we are seeing lives, we are seeing ecosystems and nature and planet. And that's exactly why these leaders who call themselves leaders will never be able to treat the climate crisis as a crisis. That's why we need people who actually see people. That's why we need to change the system in the sense that it's not the same kind of leader that's always in power, the rich old white man, the one with the privilege. We have to have a system that has the most marginalized leading the way, the most marginalized actually being able to participate, a true democracy, not what we're having now. And, and so what justice effectively means is, you know, not tampering and tinkering with what we already have, which are these highly coercive relations between the rich nations and the poor nations. But it means basically resetting those relations almost from first principles. If that were the case, what would the position of the Philippines, for example, look like now by comparison to, to what it currently is? I have troubles answering that question because the world of justice that I fight for is one that has no nations and no borders. Um, of course, first it would be to liberate all the colonized and neo-colonized countries. So it's a lot of fighting for that national liberation so that we're not so tied and dependent to Global North countries and we're able to industrialize, but with sustainability and the green transition in mind. And in the Philippines, that would mean having workers and farmers and fishing communities really at the top and the front line and leading the way. But that is just one step towards the world of justice that I'm looking for and I'm fighting for. The next step is really a world with no borders and no nations, just one community coming together. And it sounds so idealistic, but I promise that it is something that can and will happen because that is the world that we need, the world that has justice and equity and peace and we've been asked to compromise so much on our lives and the quality of people's lives and that's something that we have to question why is it so hard for us to imagine a world outside of capitalism why is it so hard for us to imagine a world outside of the injustice thank you now Rhiannon, when governments do talk about money generally the first thing they say is we don't have any and this is particularly the case when it comes to global health and the intersection of global health and environmental crisis, which you, you so eloquently laid out. Um, but, you know, it, it seems to me that almost that's an artificial constraint. Is it true that there isn't the money required for the sort of global health measures that you're talking about? And if it's not true, where does the money get found? Yeah, so I think it's definitely not true that there's no money. It's a question of where you spend your money. At the moment, countries around the world, including the UK, are spending billions subsidising fossil fuels. They're literally subsidising our own death, right? And they are spending billions on arms and spending billions on, like you said earlier, securing their borders, right? So it's not an issue of if there's enough money. It's an issue of what your priorities are. And if your priorities are the continued dominance of high income countries, and as Fahana outlined, like making sure that black and brown people who are at the front of this crisis in the global majority cannot access their rights, that is where that then you're going to say, OK, well, there's no money for responding properly to a health emergency and getting vaccines to everyone who needs them. Or there's no money for adequately um, adapting, being uh, like giving finance to other countries to adapt. If those are your priorities, yeah, then there's no money for them, right? So a lot of it is we have to force those priorities to change. And those priorities are not going to change unless we make them change, right? And a lot of it is as well, it's not just if there's enough money, but it's also about what we are allowing money to do as it is, right? So money is obviously is not just in the hands of governments, in the, it's in the hands of banks, it's in the hands of mega corporations, it's going around the global financial system. And the harm that we allow that money to do is absolutely unprecedented, 
right? We allow investment into um, oil companies, which are literally killing people, either through polluting their water or through murdering them, right? And we allow banks and we allow our financial system to pour money into those kind of activities, right? We have a completely unregulated global economy that focuses on allowing huge monopoly capitalist organizations to make as much money as they can across borders and allowing like money to flow from exploited countries in the global south for, to consumerism in places like the US and the UK, making huge amounts of money for corporations and leaving people devastated along the way. So I think, oh, and oh, no, paying no taxes in the meantime. You know, there's no, there's, there's no proper tax regulation or global financial system. So I think if anybody says there's, there's no money, there's, it's a joke, right? There's no money because it's not a priority. A, there is money if we stop spending it on things that are actively doing harm. And B, there's going to be a lot more money if we actually regulate and if we actually dismantle our global economic system, which is literally based off monopoly capitalism and the continuation of colonialism through organizations like the World Trade Organization, like the IMF and the World Bank. They're designed to keep those systems going, right? They're not designed really to like, oh, we're going to help other countries by giving them loans. In the health system, they gave those countries loans to privatize their health systems. They said, yeah, we'll give you loans. Don't worry. We're not your colonizers anymore. We'll give you some loans and you can make a nice health system so that foreign companies could come and make private healthcare systems and make loads of money, right? So I think we just need to completely, our whole idea of where money comes from and what it's used for is totally off base with what most people's priorities are. Most people want to see themselves taken care of, but we're not individuals. People want to see communities taken care of. They want to see their family. And as Mitzi was saying, like our global family and our global community. Most people, if you ask them, will say, yeah, we want a world that takes care of people and takes care of planet. We have not designed the global economy to do that. We've designed it to do the opposite. So the whole question of money, we have to actually just fundamentally go back to the drawing board and say, our economy is built on exploitation. It's built on colonialism. It's built on profit over everything else. So if you say there's no money, that's because your economic system is completely wrong. Right. So, yeah. So that would be my answer to why if there's no money. So, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not trying to be the BBC here and we're not trying to balance it with the people saying, well, the economic system's entirely right, because, of course, those are the people who get almost all the say on the BBC and the rest of the channels. But, you know, what we're all calling for here, Fahana, is something really fundamental. I mean, we're effectively calling for a different economic system. We're calling for something other than capitalism. Are we calling for too much? I mean, are we are we trying to demand from governments something that they can't possibly give us? Maybe not the politicians in charge, but that's not what we should be thinking about. We know that actually this Glasgow summit is not just important as part of the annual climate summit. It's not just part of the five-year updates of Paris. It's part of a 400-year-old cycle which is coming to an end. And I am here, as I said, to, to celebrate the end of that system and hearing these two remarkable young women who actually could be so many others around them is giving me joy, absolute joy, because they recognize, look at them, they are so eloquent. There are thousands of others aged, you know, from nine to 90 saying the same thing. And what we need to do is see our own power and not uh, count on the politicians to deliver that. We know that system is in the grip of vested interests. We need to call out that and, and, and have faith in our own agency to change that. And people will come with us. And they are coming with us all over, all over the world, from, from young to the elderly, you know, from the dispossessed, the marginalised, and even the middle classes and those who recognise the 1% of the global population that has actually contributes about 15% of all of the emissions. The 10% of the world's population, even though they may be, some of them may be in China, some of them in Indonesia, some of them in Pakistan, where I come from, some of them in the UK, that 10% is responsible for 50% of the world's emissions. We know that. And those facts need to come to the fore. We need to change our systems to do that. And I think that's a very telling thing. And I sound a little bit spiritual, um, but, you know, hey-ho, Scotland has a huge role in this reset of the 400 year reset, because Scotland and its th thought leaders and its engineers and its scientists, Scotland, not England, actually created the 
the intellectual foundations and were the, the, the laboratory and the engineers that created the Industrial Revolution. They created the steam engine, you know. We, we, so, yeah, come on, take responsibility, Scotland. And to my, again, joy, yesterday Nicola Sturgeon met with uh, a delegation of the Minga Alliance, who are a hundred uh, leaders here from the Alaska to the Patagonia, from, from the Americas, and held a spiritual sort of healing ceremony and a commitment that was given by Nicola Sturgeon, who is the host of COP26, by the way. She's not got a formal role in the negotiations, but she's the host, and she committed to doing her best to do climate justice. And so, you know, everywhere the world over, let's see each other, let's build our own alliances, let's not put too much faith in what will come out of the COP, the COP will change. We are the gravitational pull and we will bring the COP year by year, month by month, you know, year, five year cycle by five year cycle. We always have done uh, and we will see each other and we will support each other no matter what these governments are doing, no matter what they're doing, we will change them. We've got just, just a, a minute more of the programme. So very quickly, Mitzi, um, t t tell me what you are going to be doing in the next few days at COP to try to make all that happen? Of course, very Fridays for Future style. There will be a lot of spontaneous actions as we react to the injustices that will probably happen at, these, at the, the conference so that we can push and make sure that we can change these things. But some of the things that are already planned is on the 5th, on Friday, there is a youth climate strike and everyone is invited, all ages. And of course, there's the People's March on the November 6th also. And really, I think what's so important in these next few days is us connecting with each other people and civil society and different movements from different parts of the world and different cultures and different angles of, of um, social justice coming together to talk about our common liberation and to build that beautiful world that we're trying to build together. And that's what I'm literally looking forward to at this UN Climate Summit. It's having all these people come together and unite and be in solidarity with one another. Th thank you, Mitzi. And um, can, can I ask you, Rhiannon, for people who can't join the protests who aren't at Glasgow or are just too busy to actually get out onto the street and march, what can they do to support this agenda? So, so much. And what I won't do is I won't overwhelm people with a whole load of list of things to do, but join the movement, right? Whatever you're interested in, whatever your skills, there is a place for you in the climate movement. If you love graphic design, if you love making tea and cakes for people at meetings, whatever it is that you love, we need you and we want you. So if you're not sure where to start, go to the COP26 Coalition website. They have local groups all over the country. Um, if you are at university, go to look at your university groups. There are so many ways to get involved and the first step is starting and it will go from there. Thank you so much, all three of you. It's been a real pleasure, a real privilege to talk to Fahana, Mitzi and Rhiannon. Um, really three incredibly inspiring and articulate people. Um, I honour you and thank you for joining us. And thank you to all the audience. I hope there's lots of you listening to Monbiosis on COP26.tv.